Thank you. It is an honor to be with you today. Our traditional health management strategies have really relied on five principles, antimicrobials, vaccines, herd elimination, regional control, and biosecurity. But each of those, to some degree, are under threat. Judicious, judicious antimicrobial usage, antimicrobial resistance, the cost and the time, the enormous cost and time required for vaccine development and drug development, the reality that after elimination at the herd level or at a regional level, we have rebreaks, sometimes very devastating. And the lack of knowledge that we have on biosecurity principles, what, what are really needed, and, and even when best practices are implemented, why things sometimes go wrong. I believe there will be a need for improved health management strategies in the future. We have new diseases. We have pathogen evolution. We know we are living in a society of reduced antimicrobial usage. We have intensive farms, large number of pigs on the same air spaces. We have zoonotic threats. And we have increased public scrutiny with both disease control and animal welfare. And my question to you today is, will vaccines be enough to control disease in the future? In human medicine, the future is genomics. With a small sample of spit or saliva or oral fluids and a few hundred dollars, you can have your DNA screened and you can go now to your MD with your personal profile. It'll be a history of inherited conditions such as cystic fibrosis. What is your risk for genetic factors such as Alzheimer's disease, celiac disease, Parkinson's? Phenotypic traits, some of them important, like alcohol flush reaction, asparagus met met metabolo <laughs> metabolic detection, caffeine metabolism, etc. And then some very serious traits, such as reaction to common drugs. Those are very important things that now, on an individual level, we can learn about ourselves, and that fits uh, within our own personal medical profile. Genomics has been used in swine in the past, and we benefit from many of the traits that have been discovered, such as litter size, <clears throat> a couple important receptors, the estrogen receptor, urethroproietin receptor, and their influence on litter size. Many genomic traits associated with growth, feed efficiency, feed intake, carcass quality, and then some of the more famous notable diseases such as porcine stress syndrome and how that's associated with the HAL1843 gene and the RN meat quality gene of the, of the Hampshire breed. On the infectious disease side, we're starting to see some changes as well. In the last decade, there have been a couple of genes associated with E. coli resistance, the FAABAC receptor one, the F18 being the second. <clears throat> We are starting to see data now being compiled, allowing us to develop animals that are more resilient to some of the more important diseases. A lot of work in PERS in the last five or six years, PCV2 resistance. My question is, will we have at some point in time a test to allow us to select animals with overall immune resistance to many diseases? Now, disease traits come in different forms. If we would like complete resistance, then we would be looking for a single marker type disease trait. Examples before you. The FUT1, which is a gene associated with E. coli and how it attaches to the intestinal wall. The HAL1843 gene and how it is involved with uh, meat acidity and the RN gene in Hampshire with meat quality. In each of those cases, an animal without the gene that codes for susceptibility is completely resistant to those three genes. It would be nice if things were that simple, but infectious disease, as we know, is always complex. Most of our disease traits with infectious uh, diseases are really polygenic in nature. And the example I show you here is recent data from the University of Nebraska showing the potential genes that are associated with resilience to porcine circovirus. 
There are a number that are shown. This is called a Manhattan plot, and on this plot we see the various chromosomes from 1 to 19 along the x-axis, and we see the amount of variation that each of these black dots contributes to resistance. These are genes that we know that are annotated, so those are specific dots, genes contributing to resistance, and the higher they are on the Manhattan plot, the more they contribute to resistance. There are also genes such as this one here and these two here that we don't even know what they do, but we know that based on this research they do contribute to resistance. We've heard today in the first session, in the viral session, the benefits of gene editing, specifically with uh, PERS resilience, and in this case, complete resistance to PERS infection. So this is a process by which we can now very, very specifically uh, edit the genome to take out a causative mutation and replace it with a new bit of DNA that would code for resistance, and in this case, uh, like we see here on the right-hand side is, in this case, gene, uh, pigs that uh, do not have the CD163 receptor are, in fact, completely resistant to PERS infection. A breakthrough. No question that this is remarkable research that will pave the way for the future, but it'll take a long time to see this uh, come to the commercial market. But there is hope. But we're now not only interested in the genome, which will be the DNA that makes up each of our cells, but we're interested more in functional genomics. So functional genomics takes us from the genotype right through to the phenotype. Uh, so we have, whoops, sorry, we have, whoops, I can't get my fingers right here. We have the genome, which is the DNA that is encoded. We have the epigenome, so that is a study of the systematic turning on and turning off of genes that happens either uh, in development or later in life. We have the transcriptome. This is the study of the genes that are turned on after a disease process begins. So in response to infection, which genes are turned on, which genes are turned off. The proteome which proteins are important in response to various diseases, and metabolome, how are those biochemical pathways up and down regulated in response to disease? And now, each of these in sequence is very important to describe the phenome, which would be disease resistance or disease uh, resilience. So the question I have is, will genomics be sufficient to control all diseases in the future? And I believe that's, that's doubtful. We've made tremendous advances in the last decade, but at a tremendous cost. Millions of dollars invested into just a couple of individual diseases, and we have many diseases that need to be controlled. Most of our infectious disease traits are polygenic in nature. They're not as simple as cutting out a single gene and having complete resistance. There's always the opportunity for interaction with other positive traits. So if we cut out 163, well, what does that do to the immune system? Those are questions that we need to sort out before uh, we will see those pigs come to market. Many geneticists are very concerned about messing up the major histocompatibility genes. Those are on chromosome 7. And those genes are important to all of us because the more variability there are in our MHC genes, the more likelihood we have of responding to a greater number of pathogens. And as we start to decrease variability with MHC, then we stand the risk of actually having less responsiveness to diseases. They have very complex logistics from discovery to application, and there's always that risk that the consumer or the regulatory authorities will not accept what we're doing today with respect to gene editing or gene modification. But I believe that the application of genomics will be important when it comes to vaccine usage and vaccine development. First off, with vaccine development, there's a, there's a concept which is called now reverse vaccinology. And that's where we take the sequence of an organism that we can't even grow in the lab or grow in and put into a bottle, but we can manufacture the proteins that may be associated with virulence. So I think that's the first way that vaccine manufacturers may use genomics in the future. 
There are three other ways that I think you and I in the field and in the industry can be using genomics to improve our vaccine strategy that I'd like to go into in more detail. So the first one is selection of animals with improved vaccine response. I'll use a very simple example. What you're seeing in those histograms on the left specifically are anti antibody titers in pigs following two doses of mycoplasma vaccine. And you can see they form a roughly a bell-shaped curve, normally distributed, but we have some animals that, have high respond that are high responders, produce a lot of antibody. On the right-hand side, we have a similar chart, but it's, me it's a measurement of the cell-mediated immune system. In this case, we're measuring interferon gamma, following two doses of vaccine. But the same principle applies. It's largely normally distributed. And what, what I'd like to point out is we have the ability today to measure variation in the immune response following vaccination. As long as we have a relevant test, we can select against it. It may be specific to a given antigen, or hopefully in the future, we will be able to measure general immune responses. It requires a test which has high genetic correlation and high heritability, and we're very fortunate that in the human literature, these tests do in fact have moderate to high heritability. The question will be, should we select the high responders, or are we really interested in eliminating the low or the non-responders? And I think we should start there, but this would require the cooperation of the genetics companies who may or may not be interested in this approach. So the second way that we can use genomics to improve our vaccine, vaccination strategies is in the identification of high-risk animals in which we can justify either higher-end vaccine strategies or more intense monitoring. The example I'll use here is a population of pigs, which I've demonstrated here with red and green dots within a farm. And that's a heterogeneous population where we have some animals at higher risk to disease than other animals. And just think of what we could do if we could identify the high and the low risk populations and treat them differently. You may see that as being far-fetched, but in fact, this is data from the Pregnant Guilt Project that we've completed in Saskatoon over the last four or five years. And what I've done here is divided the 100 animals that we inoculated with PERS into different populations. The red being the susceptible, the green being the resilient, and this is based on viral load in the y-axis and fetal mortality rate on the x-axis. And just think of what we could do if we could separate our sow farms into animals that are of higher or lower risk of disease following a PERS inoculation. And I think that is possible. But it requires an accurate assessment of the phenotypes. It requires our knowledge on what modified vaccine protocol or intensive monitoring we would have to implement in order to ensure that, in fact, our strategies are, in, are in fact, efficacious. And obviously, this would be much easier to implement if we had good functional genomic tests available to identify the high-risk populations, but we're working towards that. The third way that I believe vaccine or genomics will be useful in vaccine strategies of the future is in the development of novel vaccines for targeted populations. And this one will be more controversial, particularly for those that are organizing this seminar today. So the the picture I've got in front of me here, or in front of you, is in fact the population structure based on 60K, 60K SNP profiling. So a vertical line represents a pig, and there are 150 pigs across that graph, and the colors within each vertical line represent one of six different ancestors that may contribute to each of those pigs. Think of them as breeds or breeding lines. Each color represents a different breeding line. Now, if you look across that, you may be able to detect there are some differences, but in fact, can you detect that there are four farms represented in that graph? Farm one, farm two, farm three, farm four. And that got me thinking. 
And what was more intriguing to me was, in fact, those four farms are represented in three different regions. Two of them were in the US, one of them in Canada, and one of them in Europe. And that really got me thinking, what about the heterogeneity of the genotypes that we see across the world? Is it true that pigs are pigs? Or are pigs unique in their own areas, in their own regions? Uh, and I think those are questions that we really need to have answered. We have a vast gen genomic heterogeneity, and maybe vaccines should be targeted specifically to some areas or some regions, or maybe even some genetic lines that are basically designed to ensure we have a satisfactory immune response. So that requires an understanding of the diversity of pigs across the world. And at that point, we don't have that understanding today, but we have the technology to understand that if we put our minds to it. It also requires a large enough market in any one of those genetic diverse regions to develop a new product or a new strategy, and that could be done either by a global pharmaceutical company or perhaps that could be done by a niche market company as well. So where I believe we're moving, and we see this already in the dairy industry, is having a dashboard that will be available to us when investigating any farm. And on that dashboard, we will have various disease traits that can be used, and we will see across a population, a farm, or even a, multiple farms in a region, what the disease susceptibility could be for various diseases based on available genomic testing, or based on vaccine responsiveness, based on what we have in the literature. Some of this data is already compiled. We have it. We just haven't got it in a usable form that is useful for us. But I would envision in the next five to 10 years that, I th that this will become available. So in conclusions, we have excellent vaccines, and we have fantastic technical support. And we must applaud our global partners for their work of the past. Our swine health management is really based on 20th century technology. Genomic technologies will continue to evolve, and the solving of the complex health issues of the 21st century, I believe, will take more than vaccines. I think we're moving towards an era of personalized and predictive vaccinomics instead of a one-size-all-fits approach, very similar to Dr. DePetri. And I think, friends and colleagues, we are really moving towards personalized medicine for pig populations. Thanks very much.